My name is Shami Kalra. I'm the founder and owner of Amologato Watches. My interest in motorsport began, I think my earliest memory was probably when I was about 15 or 16 years old and I just happened to, to turn on the TV and there was, um, I believe, yeah, it was Formula One. It was a Formula One race, I can't remember which one. And seeing racing drivers doing what they're doing and at the speeds that they were doing at, it instantly gave me the bug of, uh, of motorsport. This is my pride and joy. My first Porsche I ever bought myself when I was 37 years old. I've had it uh, 10 years now, so you can work out my age. Um, the colours express what I love about uh, historical racing, so it has the Martini colours. It's also painted in quite a special slate grey, which is a historic uh, Porsche colour. And it's a car, I've had many Porsches after this, and I'm due to get some more Porsches as well over the next few years but I'll never sell this one. It's, um, it's the last car my, my dad also went in before he passed away, so uh, it's very special. The idea behind the Molligato watches is very, um, it's an interesting story because it's a human story. It wasn't a corporate thing. It wasn't a bunch of guys getting together with some investment money. It literally started because my wife and I had an argument. I was totally jaded with what I was doing. I'd done the corporate stuff for years. Um, I, you, know, you have to do the corporate stuff when you have young children. So my wife and I had this argument and she was bored of me being miserable. So she said, you know, you just sort yourself out. You've got, to, you've got to do something that gives you a bit of passion. You've got to do something that makes you feel alive. And I'd always wanted to start my own brand, but I hadn't had the opportunity before. Um, so I went away and designed these four watches over the weekend, all to do with liveries that I'd been um, influenced by over the years. And then I emerged two days later, literally we didn't speak the whole weekend because I was really upset with what she said and she was really upset with me being a miserable old git. So um, on Monday morning I had the designs ready. They looked absolutely fabulous, but obviously we needed a name. There's no, there's no point in having a product without a nice name that draws you in. I have always loved uh, my dream car, if I can ever get there one day, is a Ferrari 288 GTO. Uh, 288 is a beautiful body. GTO stands for Gran Turismo, which means it's a grand touring car. And the O on GTO stands for homologato, which means it's been homologated and ready to race. I've, got, I've always wanted a GTO car, and I've always loved the name homologato. And so after about a few hours of, of coming up with, this, with these designs, probably at about 10 o'clock in the morning on the Monday, I suddenly started thinking about what name you would try and incorporate. And Amologato was born basically from, from that. I obviously needed an outlet. Um, and the easiest way was to, to build your own website rather than looking for somebody else to stock them or try and sell them for you. I registered the name and started building the website probably at about six o'clock on the Monday evening. There were some really good stores that you can just buy regular software. So it was very sort of intuitive and I'm quite au fait with online stuff anyway. So it, it was quite, not, not easy, but it was intuitive. And I started building the website. I think I went to bed at about 3.30 that morning, woke up again at about seven in the morning on the Tuesday. And the website went live at about four o'clock in the afternoon. Social media is very important to me. So I'd open the social media channels, so Instagram and Twitter. I already have another Twitter account where I have um, quite a lot of interaction with people who love motorsport. So I opened an Amologato Twitter account, which immediately, I think in the first day, we got something like 200 followers immediately. So that's potentially 200 customers immediately. I left the website for a couple of days, thought nothing of it. And then on uh, Thursday evening, remembering this is six days after I had the idea, um, my first sale came through at 7.30 in the evening. I was sitting down, my phone pinged because it makes a noise every time a sale happens. And I could not believe that someone had bought two of my watches, two of the ones that I designed the week before. And it was almost like, hold on a second, is this, is this happening? And then half an hour later, somebody else, and then, that evening, I think I sold seven watches in the space of about four hours. So suddenly there was an income, there was something happening. People were interacting, people were coming back to me on social media and saying, well, who the hell are you? And these watches are amazing and I'm gonna have one. Within two weeks of the website going live, 
all the stock that I'd ordered in had sold out completely. So I had to reorder again to make sure that other orders that were, that, that were coming in were, were, were fulfilled. Within four weeks, this wasn't just a little bit of extra income that I thought I might get. This was now a viable business. Within two months, we made a profit. So it wasn't a question of where we had um, tooling costs and all the rest of it because I had all the components ready. After one month, I realized that, you know what, this could be a full-time job. This could be, a, this could be something. And I actually packed in 25 years of what I've been doing with other people, which gave me a great income, but I was so bored of it. I, I jacked it in within four weeks and I took the gamble of, of backing the brand and, and going for it. So one of my favorite designs is the, is the Can-Am watch. Um, firstly, the Can-Am series was very exciting to watch. I think it started in 1967, but it was outlawed in 1975. Um, one of the most famous racing colours in the Can-Am series was the bright orange that McLaren used in the series, and they were very successful in, in the series as well. So I designed the watch to show, firstly, the colours that were prolific in the, in the series, but also the fonts that were used as uh, numbers on the actual cars. So I've emulated the indexes on the actual watch face to actually show, um, well, to try and emulate the, the racing cars of that time. Uh, but the orange is that was definitely a, pr a prominent colour in that particular series. When looking at new designs of watches, I usually go from things that have influenced me in the past. Um, so my original designs were racing liveries. It was the colours that influenced me in the beginning and they were the ones that I launched initially. And then once, that be once I realised that became a viable sort of business, it allowed me to reinvest in new products. I started looking at what races influenced me, the history behind everything. Because there's no point in just having, for me anyway, I, I believe every watch should have a story. In actual fact, that's our strap line of what we do. And so every watch that I do design has a story behind it. The Berlinetta probably tells one of the most um, epic stories of racing and a racer. It was designed around the inspiration that I had from a, a Ferrari 250 short wheelbase that uh, Sir Sterling Moss raced in uh, 1960 at the Taurus Trophy at Goodwood. Now, he got out of, he got into that car, sorry, after having crashed his Formula One car three months before and ending his Formula One career. And everyone said he actually ended his career. Three months later, Rob Walker offered him the opportunity of driving 250 GT short wheelbase, chassis number 2119 GT number seven. And this particular watch tells the story of that whole time that he, against all odds, got into another car and actually won the race, uh, despite the fact that everyone thought his racing career was over. So in this particular design, I've actually incorporated the chassis number 2119 GT and on the back it's engraved with the date of why that car was so spectacular, why that race was so spectacular and the legend that drove it, so Sterling Moss and uh, the implications and the, the importance of him winning that race carried, it actually gave him the confidence to carry on with his racing career. So that particular watch isn't just called the Berlinetta for the sake of it, it gives you the story of what happened at Goodwood in 1960. One of the riskiest designs I ever did was the Laguna Seca. Globally, it's one of the most iconic places. And every time I spoke to a racing driver about what was their favorite track, which was the one that they would stood out, the amount of times people said Laguna Seca. But not only did they say Laguna Seca, they came out with the corkscrew almost immediately after that corner, the corkscrew. If you've ever played it on PlayStation or if you've ever been lucky enough to drive it, it's an amazing corner, it, it's a sharp left, it drops down almost three stories, maybe four stories, and then it's a hard right again. It's almost at a 45 degree angle. So I thought to celebrate that corner at Laguna Seca, to put the face at 45 degrees, so when you're driving and you've got your hands at 10 and two, you just flick your wrist and you can see the time and it's at the perfect angle to see the time. So I've called it a driver's watch. Not many people get it, um, and, and that's why it's a very low numbered limited edition. But the people who do get it, and if you look at the list of the racing drivers who've actually bought that watch, it makes me, feel, it makes me smile that they get it because it, I call it the, the ultimate driver's watch. Many customers started approaching me and giving me suggestions about, 
oh, you need to do a watch that celebrates this and you need to do one that celebrates that. And the ideas were coming through thick and fast. But one thing I knew I had to do was to celebrate Ferrari. For me, a Ferrari watch is, um, they do a lot of commercial stuff, but I wanted, to, I wanted to show the motorsport behind it because a lot of the other watches out there only celebrated the car brand, which is fair enough, it's successful. So I spent, it took me six months to come up with the idea of how to get this right, what to do. And it took a lot of sort of asking historians, if you like, with what was influential, what was the most important part of it, what did they do? We all know the modern stuff, because it, it's very modern, but how did they get there? And to, so I wanted to create a watch which showed how Scuderia Ferrari got to where they were. I own the name Marinello for watches. I own the name, on all the names that I own, it's only for watches. And I, and I wanted to create this story to show how Scuderia Ferrari started. Owning the name Marinello, I had to build in this story into it. So the story started developing in my head and I realized in 1961, that was the first time that Enzo Ferrari won the Constructors World Championship for Formula One. He was with Alfa Romeo before he left in 1948 to start up Ferrari. And it took him until 1961 to get a, a championship winning car. And that was driven by Phil Hill. So the watch story was there. Now we had to create something to go with the story. So if you look at the outer bezel of uh, Maranello 1961, although the design looks very... It's not a simple design, but it looks very obvious now. That took me six more months to get to that stage to build it, because if you put too much information onto a watch, it looks like a bit of merchandise from a gift shop, and you can't allow a watch to look like that. So I wanted to tell the story by just by looking at the face. You can tell what happened in 1961. All eight tracks from the Formula One season, laser etched on the outside bezel, and all the races that Ferrari won on that year are all in Rosso Corsa, the racing red. People think of um, Ferrari as being Rosso Corsa, bright red, everything's red, red, red. But actually, the other most one of the most important colors that they used at the time was Grigio Titania. I hope that's the right word, I'm pretty sure it's Titania, but Grigio definitely. Um, and, and that was a very important color for Ferrari. So when people were saying, oh, you're building a Ferrari watch, I said, yes, I am. They all expected it to be lashings of red. And when I actually used the Grigio, which is a very influential colour, I think that subtlety was... Actually, immediately the watch was, was a hit. It started selling immediately. It wasn't an obvious Ferrari watch. You had to tell the story. So if someone was wearing it and, and you asked what it was, there's a 20-minute conversation there if you wanted it to be. Through Amalagato, I've been able to meet some really interesting people. I mean, it's, uh, I've met my heroes, I've met influential people, but one of the most memorable meetings I had is I was invited to the British Racing Drivers Club uh, lunch in December after uh, the season, and we were all uh, gathered in a big uh, sort of reception room up in London, about two or 300 people all having a glass of uh, welcome drink or champagne or whatever it was. And then there was a call to lunch and there was a, a very sort of um, narrow staircase down to where we were all sort of gathered for lunch. Two abreast maximum you could get down there. And as I was funneling down there, I felt a, a hand on my elbow and I looked around and it, it was John Surtees, which shocked me completely. And he said, would you mind helping a, a, yeah, a, an old chap down to lunch? And I looked at him and I said, There's, there's not many times that a legend comes and asks you that. And then he sort of looked at me and said, where's the legend? And he looked behind him. So his humility was immediate. Within 30 seconds of meeting him, I knew I almost got his character straight away. I've been a fan for years, been reading about him for years. And the fact that he was holding onto my arm and I was taking him down to lunch was just surreal. We got talking. We started talking, I can't remember, motorsport probably, the food. Uh, being in London that day, just general stuff, and we got on really, really well. And um, 
So we I left it at that. And about two months later, I met him again at another event. I said, do you remember? He said, yes, of course I remember you. How are you? And from there, we, we started developing a very, um, a very nice friendship. It was formal in the beginning, but it was a nice friendship. I kept on seeing it at, at different events and what have you. And then one, there was one afternoon that I met him and I actually said to him, um, would you, I told him what I did and he knew anyway. And I said, would you like to do a project? And he said, oh, I, I, I don't really put my name to anything. And if you look through the years, he never puts his name to anything. I think luggage companies and car companies have all approached him to ask him to make a, a Surti special edition. So I knew he might be reluctant with the idea, but what I wanted to do was also give something back to the Henry Surtees Foundation, um, uh, he, uh, a foundation he started after the death of his son when he died in, a, in an accident in 2009. So the, immediate, the idea was immediately of interest to him because I was giving something, putting something back rather than just making it commercial and taking. And so he liked the idea. And so we, I think it probably took us about a year to sit down after that, where we agreed what we would do, how we would do it. And then uh, six months after that, we agreed again to sit down and start designing it because he wanted to design the watch, which I was honored with because it'd be you know, to have somebody like that to give you the input of what you're making. It was, um, it was a massive honor. And we were meant to sit down in February this year. Um, so in 2017, February, we were meant to sit down. Unfortunately, I got the call in January to say he wasn't very well and that um, you know we'd have to postpone it and, until he's better. And then obviously March after then, we, we had the bad news that unfortunately he passed away. And I thought the project uh, had also stopped as well because um, he, was, he was an intrinsic part. About four weeks after his funeral, I got a lovely phone call from his daughter, Leonora, who said, um, Dad always spoke about you. He always spoke about this project. He really wanted this project to go and the family really want this project to, 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 to be finished. And so I picked up where we'd finished about 80% of the design and I picked up the rest of it with his family and his widow. And um, I'd say about six weeks later, after finishing the designs, making sure the components were all, over it, all ready, we launched the watch. And I actually shed a tear when it went out. When we sent the press release out, it was a really emotional product. It, it, to me, even now, when I sell one, the story that goes behind it, the friendship, the design, the input, the impact he made to the motorcycle world as well as the racing world, it, it's not a product for me. It's actually a part of him and his history. You'll see on the outside here we have the, I can only describe it as the 30s racing blue. And this was the colour that John actually used on his helmet and he used on his race cars whenever he went out racing. We've incorporated that into the actual design. It's also autographed by him as well. That's how much he wanted to put his name to a product. He allowed me to use his autograph on it. The indexes emulate a lot of the designs that were prolific in the 60s and possibly early 70s as well. So we've used the fonts again and, and also the specifications of a lot of the late 60s, early 70s watches. And also the shape of the actual case is not there by, by fluke. It's actually there because a lot of the late 50s watches were round and slightly smaller. So um, we, wanted to, we wanted to incorporate his history from the MV Augusta days as well as history from his Ferrari days and then incorporate the Surtees Racing Blue. So there's lots of elements of design going on in there, including the Sunray grey dial, which is also to do with a couple of race cars that were very close to him. So I was at, um, at a meet at Goodwood, I think it was probably about 18 months ago, um, a bit longer, um, where I'd said, wouldn't it be nice to actually organise our own thing? And a friend of mine said, well, why don't you do it? Well, actually, it's not a bad idea. So I, I have a, a lot of friends, namely at Porsche Retail Group in, in England. And um, I phoned them up on the Monday. This was a Sunday morning conversation. I phoned them on Monday and said, how about if I bring racing drivers, watches and cars to an event? Would you like to do something? They fell in love with the idea immediately. And two and a half weeks later, we started Chronos and Cars, which is an event where people... Um, you turn up and what makes you smile, so it doesn't have to be something worth gazillions, it's just something that makes you smile. You wear a watch that makes you tick, and then you uh, take a picture that, that, that inspires, and that, that's basically 
in, in a roundabout way, that's the strap line of the actual event. So we had our first Krenners in Cars, and on that day we had people like the director Pinner and Farina came in, he flew in actually, um, the sales director of Koenigsegg, um, a friend of mine who bought his almost priceless McLaren F1 came along, and possibly around 180 people, and this was only done through social media. We only did it through Twitter and Instagram to say this event was happening. It was free at the time on that particular first one, but it was an in instant success. Our second one, I think, was possibly even better. We did it at another venue, and we had a, uh, an XF1 driver and a current Formula E driver, Nick Heidfeld, actually flew in from Zurich for the day. He left Zurich at five o'clock, arrived at our event, and then said hello to all the guests. Marino Franchitti came along, who's a great guy, a great driver. Richard Atwood, who won Le Mans in 1970, came. Freddie Hunt, who's James Hunt's son, he came along. So not only was it a cars and coffee type morning, where people generally just sort of met in a car park and said, that's a lovely car, that's a... I was actually bringing racing drivers along, and I was actually bringing um, legends along, really. And the last one that we had, we, we were very lucky to have Derek Bell, um, who won Le Mans five times, he came along. I'm really excited about the next Chronos and Cars because that one, I think, will go to another level. Would I change anything? No, I'm having a really good time at the moment. Yesterday, I worked 20 hours. Seven days a week, I do it. And coming up to three years old now, and I'm still doing 15 to 18 hours a day, but it doesn't feel like work anymore. It was, it's, just, it's just a pleasure to do everything. I've made some mistakes on a couple of products, but that's how, that's how things work. Uh, but no, I wouldn't change anything. I'm really enjoying it, and I'm, I'm really enjoying the social aspect of, of, of running a Mologato. You know, like, each watch is like a baby to me, so you can't have a favourite, really. I do have a couple of favourites, but I don't sort of shout about it. Today I'm wearing the Marinello, but I always choose a watch depending on what event I'm going to.